All right, so let me skip to the slide. All right, so uh, like uh, previous sessions, so the idea here is I will um, probably talk for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes-ish. Be my guess, I have um, some, uh, some examples of stuff that I'm going to show you guys. Um, we're going to talk about working with non-MARC data. Uh, particularly what I'm interested in uh, making sure um, everybody uh, is able to see how it works is translating um, data from um, uh, delimited files, Excel files into MARC and how that works, what are the limitations, um, what are the options there. We won't show all of them, but I'll talk about how each thing works. Uh, part of the reason um, I want to make sure we start there is because I'm also going to show you how the um, XML JSON uh, translation wizard works. So I'm going to have a set of past perfect data that I'm going to show you how to, to, to set up. Um, this is a tool that um, we'll be working on a Mac probably uh, by the end of the day or Saturday. Um, I've been uh, working hard this week trying to get it uh, crossed over. Uh, it's one of the few pieces of the soft of Mark Edit that um, isn't uh, in parity. <clears throat> and it's partly because the, um, the interface is, is slightly different uh, in terms of how they get hosted. But I think I've got that sorted out. So I'm working on bringing those together. Uh, and I want to make sure that folks have an idea of how those things work together. Um, and since it reuses the same kind of um, interface as the delimited text translator, um, making sure you understand how that one works first is important. Um, we'll look at just non-MARC data generally and how you edit functions, how MARC edit manages functions, um, how you can register functions and how they can be used in other places. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, where those get reused. So for example, harvesting data via OAI, PMH, um, and uh, and then answer questions. Um, so I'm assuming, like I said, I'm assuming roughly 40, 45 minutes. And then any questions that uh, you guys have, um, I'll be happy to, to answer. Uh, and like I said, these are the, oh, and then I'll, I'll talk about how you create delimited text uh, from Mark Edit, since there's people ask sometimes how you um, create uh, delimited um, outputs. Um, so we'll, we'll go through those, those particular things. So those are my three topics. All right, so let's start with uh, working with uh, delimited text. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through the slides and I'll show you how this stuff works within MarkEdit. So MarkEdit's limited text translator um, works against Excel and Access. Um, it works with delimited text. Um, I prefer tab, but you can use any particular format. Um, the delimited text, uh, just so that you know if you're working with either tab or comma delimited or pipe delimited, <clears throat> the tool's been designed um, to uh, work most closely with the outputs that Microsoft's Excel um, will output. And that's important to know because delimited text doesn't have a standard per se. And so when you output delimited text um, in another application, especially if you put qualifiers around data, they sometimes work differently. And so you'll find um, when you import delimited text into MarkEdit, you may find things um, sometimes don't process the way that you want them to um, or the way that you would expect. Most of the time, that's because there's a, a fundamental difference in the way that the program that output the delimited text or the way that the delimited text was created is different than the way Excel um, would create that process. And really, I just had to, to pick a version of something to standardize the delimited text processing rules on. And since Excel is used widely, that's what I use. Um, so my recommendation is if you're importing data with delimited text and it's not looking like you would expect, if you have Excel on your system, import it into Excel and then work directly with the Excel files. So. MarkEdit supports two different types of Excel translations. And depending on the version of MarkEdit, it may only be one, but I'm assuming everybody's using a current version. The two modes that you have is a legacy OBDC mode um, and then a native mode. So the legacy mode um, is the way that MarkEdit worked from 
um, prior to market at seven. So market at six and earlier used what's called an OBDC driver. This is a database driver that gets installed with Excel. And that driver was used in order to provide um, support for reading uh, Excel and access data. Now, the challenge with using an OBDC driver is that you had to tell MarkEdit which um, version of the driver you were using. So you can't install a 32 and a 64-bit driver on the same machine. So you would have to tell MarkEdit which version of the driver you're using because MarkEdit may um, be running in a 64-bit version, may be running as a 64-bit application and needs to be able to know how to access the individual objects. Um, and so you had to tell it a little bit about um, how you were working in order for the application to work. So with Office 365 and more and more organizations moving towards that subscription, the OBDC drivers became more and more problematic. And there are some reasons for that. So the, the primary reason is that in order to support um, more security, Microsoft is moving to a model where a lot of their applications run within a sandbox. And so Office 365 was one of the first. And so when you install Office 365, even though it looks like a regular program, it's actually installed within a container. And that container doesn't allow you to access the database components. In order to do that, you actually have to download a separate um, redistributable, which allows um, a bridge between your version of Office and um, applications that may need to access that driver. So it got to be really, really problematic working with um, the native uh, Office driver. And so in market at seven, I brought in to the application a native driver. So a driver that actually reads and can write Excel data uh, without having to have Office um, or Excel installed. And so those get set in the preferences inside of Mark Edit, and this is true both for the Windows and the Mac version, you will find in the other settings um, an option here for MS Office settings. And if you check the Use Legacy options, which is not the default, then the program will require that you have Excel installed and that you tell Mark Edit which version of Excel you have installed. And for most users, that version will be a 32-bit application. That's super important for the application? No, because what happens is then market it has to restart itself as a 32-bit application in order to access Excel data. Um, if you tell it it's a 64-bit application, then again, the program can run within its normal 64-bit space. Um, but this is how you tell market it which flavor of the, uh, the Excel um, uh, driver you're using. So by default, I prefer the native driver. Um, the reason why this legacy component's still there is when I first put this together, one of the challenges was figuring out how to um, handle formulas and things like that. I believe all of that's been worked out, um, but that's part of also the reason why the native, the, the legacy driver's still there. If for some reason I've missed something, you can flip to the legacy driver, do the process, send me an error report and I'll fix it and extend the, uh, the native driver. But, but by and large, I think at this point, everything's been covered. Uh, okay, um, so troubleshooting. So a couple things that come up when working with Excel data all the time. Um, these are actually less problematic um, using the native driver than the uh, previous driver, um, the Excel driver, and there's a reason for that. So the common problems that come up is my data um, is extracting truncated or my ISBNs look wonky, or I'm getting errors when trying to process Excel data. So the first two are related specifically to the way that Excel um, data types. So Excel, unlike a database, um, treats all data when it comes into the system as general. And when um, the, the data has been indexed inside of Excel, so Excel does some stuff internally to optimize data reading, um, what it does is it reads the first six lines, uh, the first six rows, and based on the data that shows up in each one of those columns, it types those columns. So let's say I have a thousand records in my Excel file, and in those first six records, I have descriptions that are really small, but in the seventh record, I have a description that's 1,200 characters. Excel 
will only read the first 255 because it'll read those first six values, read that they're small, and set the data type as what's called a var character. So it sets it, 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 it truncates all of your data to 255 characters. In Excel, you see the whole data set, but through the API and the database access, it removes and truncates all data past that, um, that data type. Inside of the native driver, the tool is able to read deeper into the um, into the Excel file and read data types based on actual data inside the record. So um, there's less of a problem there. ISBN data, same thing. ISBN data looks like scientific notation data. So if those first six values don't include an X in them um, or something that would uh, that would be alphanumeric but are just alpha characters, then they get typed as scientific notation. There are um, help files here that show you in Excel how to convert Excel inside so that it um, sets a data type for that particular uh, column, removing the predictive data and allowing the OBDC driver to work slightly different. Again, this was a problem that showed up a lot in Mark Edit 6. It'll show up a lot if you're using Mark Edit 7 and you've got the um, OBDC driver, the legacy driver in use. And so you need to be aware of how to fix it. Uh, this is the issue I just talked about in terms of Excel, um, the OBDC driver being um, uh, unavailable and uh, a set of uh, troubleshooting in order to fix it. All right, so how does the delimited text translator work? So it's wizard-like, um, supports Unicode data, um, joining global editing um, of stuff. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, there's slides here. I'm gonna go ahead and open the, um, the delimited text translator. We're gonna walk through it and talk about the options that are there. All right, so um, the delimited text translator is found under tools, where is it found? Under tools, delimited text translator. Um, you can also put it on your front screen. Um, again, I don't know if how many people know it, but in Mark Edit, um, you can set your main window and turn on which programs you want to show up there. So I tend to put the ones I use most often up there. Um, I also tend to lose programs, um, so you can actually just look for them which is also the other way I tend to find stuff. So delimited text translators. This is a delimited text translator. It starts by asking a couple questions. Um, so I'm gonna do two files, same file. One is um, a text file, one is an Excel file. So you can see the different ways that um, it processes. So we'll start with the Excel file. So you give it a source file. Um, so in this case, um, I'm gonna pick my Excel file. And I'm picking the binary Excel file. So the first thing you see um, when working with the Excel file is Mark Edit will fill in the Excel sheet name. Um, this is different than if you use the legacy option. If you use the legacy OBDC option, you're required to know the name of the set, the sheet that you're working with. There are also limitations with the legacy OBDC option. In the OBDC legacy option, sheet names can only be one word and they can't have special characters in them. The API that Excel provides will not access data that has special characters in it. Using the native driver, which is what I've got turned on now, the tool can see um, the sheet name and it can process the sheet name regardless of what that is, whether it's a non-Latin language, so for example, maybe it's in Chinese um, or Hebrew, um, to characters that are special characters. As long as it's valid for naming the sheet, it will show up here and you can access the data. So the output file um, is basically whatever the output's gonna be. So out one, and the tool generates a, um, generates not mark data, but it generates a mnemonic file. So it generates a file that can be opened within the mark editor. When you're reading data through the Excel format, the delimited values get ignored because obviously it's not using those. Um, this option will be checked by default uh, because Excel uses a different UTF-8 option, a UTF option. So um, Unicode values on a Windows computer uh, can either be UTF-32, UTF-16, UTF-8, or UTF-7. Inside of Excel, 
I believe that they're using UTF-16. So UTF-16 is problematic. It includes a null character at the end of bytes that are not multi-width. And so that means they're not um, valid in a MARC record. So what you do is you tell MarkEdit that it's using UTF-8 encoded. And what MarkEdit will do is it'll do two evaluations on your data. The first one is, um, is the data actually UTF-8? The second is, is the data a different UTF-8, di different Unicode flavor? And if it is, turn it into UTF-8 so that it's compatible with MARC. So I've selected my values, I click Next. The tool then reads my Excel file and outputs the field contents into this box here so that I can see an example of what the data is. So in this case, the first field is a header. So I'm gonna um, eventually tell it to ignore those, but that's the way so I know what's in the, in the in information. And then the contents of individual fields. And MarkEdit gives you a preview of a handful of fields in order to work with. So this gives you an option to be able to kind of snippet the data file and then be able to map it. So there isn't in MarkEdit anything that um, uh, will automatically take an Excel file and translate it into Mark. Um, you have to map the data and you can do that mapping either um, in this interface or you can do it in the header content. Uh, MarkEdit allows you to enter in like 245 subfield A um, and uh, also include the indicators and terminal punctuation. It's in the documentation on the format. Um, and then use auto-generate, and that will take the headers and auto-generate your arguments list. Most people, however, are going to get this data from a vendor, um, or they're going to output it from an ILS, and they're going to have to generate it by hand. So I'm going to show you the process. We're going to just do a handful, and then um, I'll generate a file, and then we'll uh, uh, look at the delimited options, but we won't go through the delimit the generation because it's the same file. We'll also talk about some options. All right, so um, the way that mapping works. So in this case, the first field is the publication title. So I'm going to map uh, field zero uh, to a 245 subfield subfield A. Indicator values, whatever you want. Um, I'm going to set them there, and if there's permanent terminal punctuation, needs to be added. Add your terminal punctuation. Mark edit checks to see if the punctuation exists before it puts it down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add that value. So it puts a, a value here. You see here, um, print identifier, online identifier. So I can enter in, um, you know, 020 subfield A. Um, and if I want any identifier, oops. And sorry, I need to select my field, field one. 020 subfield A, um, and then I'm going to um, go ahead and, and add that argument. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a constant data for it. So I'm going to go ahead and create a field one, 020 subfield Q, print constant data, add that argument. And then I'm going to select these two fields, right click on them, and join those together. And so that tells MarkEdit that these two fields, these two subfields are related to each other. They need to be on the same line. And so it will join those two together. So when I translate the data, it'll add the constant data element to that field and put them together. Um, we could do the same thing for the next one, uh, field two. 020 subfield A, and then constant data field 2, 020 subfield Q. Oops, that wasn't constant data. So I delete that one. Let me edit that one and see what I did. Okay, yeah, so that one's right. And then the second one, maybe I did do it. Join those items. You'll notice when I join the second set of items, it puts two asterisks. So that's how MarkEdit determines which fields are related to each other. It adds asterisks in front of them so that way you can visibly see um, the fields and how they match together. 
Um, we can look through here and add a couple more. I'll just add, um, I'll just add a URL and, and then call it good. So field nine, eight fifty six subfield U uh, four one. Let's say, and then we'll add that. All right. So um, I've got a two forty five o two O's and eight fifty six. I can sort the fields. So in that case, Mark Edit doesn't care what order you put your arguments list in. It'll sort them alphanumerically. If I want to keep the order that I've put them in, then I uncheck that. If I'm going to be processing a file that looks like this over and over again, I could check this box and save these arguments as a template. So the next time I have to process the file, I don't have to remap everything. I can just load the template and then process the data. Um, if I'm working with um, like the 245, I can have it calculate common non-filing debt values for me. Um, and Mark Edit will then use um, a file provided inside the application shortcuts under configuration, uh, delimited filing characters. You can add any characters that you want in here. It will use those as your non-filing character uh, criteria. I just threw a couple together really quickly here for an example. Um, it will look at those um, and use those to determine the creation of a non-filing uh, character point for the 245 and do that automatically so that way it's dynamic. And I can tell it to ignore the header row. So for example, this first row is one I probably wouldn't want to create mark records for. I can just go ahead and tell it to ignore that and it'll skip that first field, tell it to process, it goes ahead and creates the data file and I've got an output file. So we can go um, look at our output file. and see that the, the data has been created. We've got our constant data that we added for the print and the online, the 245, 856, um, 008 and LDR. All right, so um, easy way to process non-MARC uh, data, uh, delimited data into MARC edit. If you're using um, the uh, delimited text, the only difference between working with Excel is I select my delimited text. I still have to pick my output file. I will not write this. Um, obviously sheet name isn't important. In this case now I have to pick the delimiter. So is it a tab delimiter or is it something else? Um, if it's an other then I have to give it the character that I'm using as a delimiter and if there are any qualifiers. Again um, I check whether or not the data is UTF-8 or not. Um, and if I need to edit the LDR, so mark edit by default uses a generic LDR. Um, you can pick the one here um, that's the generic one. You can pick a particular um, uh, material type if you want. Um, you can actually add, have Mark Edit dynamically generate data into the LDR. So for example, let's say there's a 265 um, or 64 subfield C defined that has the date that I want to bring into the 008. I can use this mnemonic, 264 subfield C, and mark edit then will match the mapping created in the next field where I have a 264 subfield C, and will take that data and bring it into the 008, so long as it represents um, the, uh, the number of characters that would fit in that space. Um, so you can do stuff like that. If you're working with Unimark and you check the box, then it switches to the LDR and the 100 and you can change the data that's there. So, um, so that's kind of there. So that's the interface for handling um, delimited text. Uh, so inside the slides, I tried to cover some things that are important. So the way that you join data, um, mark edit by default, when it runs across subfields, me open up this one more time so we can explain this from the interface. Um, let me grab my file real quick. I'm just going to chew this out. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. All right. We go to here. All right. So these options here are important. So we've seen the constant data one. So that's where you can create new lines, um, constant data lines. You can create um, elements that are going to be added to fields. Um, by checking that constant data, it tells MarkEdit that it's something um, that's not coming from the, the, the delimited text. 
repeatable subfield is a particular option that tells MarkEdit the behavior to use. So inside of MarkEdit, if I define a 500 subfield A and a 500 subfield A, those two values will create two separate fields. If I wanted to have a 500 with a subfield A and a subfield A in it, I would mark those as repeatable subfields and MarkEdit then will combine those data elements together. If I don't mark them as repeatable, I can still put them on the same field, but I have to join them. I have to select them inside here and join them together. Likewise, if say for example, this was a first name and this was a last name, I can do the same thing um, with the joining fields. So for example, I could say 100 subfield A, one zero, and then let's say that was the, the, that was the last name and this is the first name. I can put them in the same subfield, join the items, and what MarkEdit will do is it will put those two elements inside the same subfield code. So the tool will read it as um, subfield A and then the contents of row one and row two. So that way, if I have fields that need to be combined in order to create a single subfield, I can do that through the joined tools by marking them as belonging to the same subfield and then allowing the tool to join them together. All right, um, if you are joining data together, sometimes folks wanna be able to export it. So MarkEdit includes a um, export tab delimited tool. So that's gonna be in tools, export, export tab delimited records, or again, um, finding it up here, export tab delimited records. It's a pretty straightforward process. Um, the tool has uh, let's see here. Can you change the order of the fields are joined? So um, first name, last name instead of the reverse. So the tools join in the order that you defined them. So if I defined in the arguments list, the first name and then the last name and join them together, they would join in that order. If I define them as the last name first and then the, and then the last name, so with the two fields and it would join them in that order. So it really depends on the order that you put them in the arguments list. So you get to control the order that they get joined in. Uh, so delimited tag, so exporting delimited, um, I'm just gonna grab a file really quick. Um, I won't go through it, but I won't, I'm not gonna export any data, but I'm gonna show you how it works. Uh, exported. Uh, so you select delimiter. So I prefer tab delimiter always. An infield delimiter is a second delimiter that's used. So if you have, so let's say I wanted to create a delimited file and I'm creating a set of delimiters, I, I'm, I'm exporting a field that's duplicated, MarkEdit will use an infield delimiter to mark where those fields are duplicated. And that's important because when you use tools like Excel, you can actually um, have Excel break columns on an infield delimiter. So that way, if you wanted to have um, those fields broken up, you could. If you don't want them, you can see where they're duplicated based on the infield delimiter. And then the context delimiter is used for those places where, say, like you're using a, you're, you're going to export a call number. And let's say you're going to do, um, let's say, 090 subfield A and subfield B. MarkEdit will use the contextual delimiter to combine data together. So that way you can see which fields, which records, if there's duplicates, had an A and a B together. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go next. Uh, so normalizing fields, so this would be if you took the whole field instead of a subfield, uh, MarkEdit will normalize out the subfield data if you ask it to. Um, there are two different ways to extract subfield data, so we can extract um, based on um, going O or O, subfield B. Um, people ask me, can I target particular fields with um, indicators, you can. MarkEdit reads the field as a in-string. So let's say I wanted to export um, subjects, but only if they were second indicator seven, I could go six, um, 50, two spaces for my indicator, 
the first indicator that I'm um, looking for, and then seven, and that will use that whole arguments list to target a particular field for export for delimited for delimited export, and then I could target the particular subfield that I wanted to, to extract. When I have that, I click on the add field. It goes up there. I can target um, parts of control fields. So let's say I wanted to extract um, from the LDR, let's say um, position seven and a length of the and the the first value. I could do LD LDR. Whoops, that gets treated as O O O um, seven one. And so that will take the LDR value. LDR translates to 000, zero, zero internally in some places. Um, again, I could do that with the 008 position, um, you know, five and four. So it'll take the fifth position starting to count at zero and then a length of four characters. So I can extract out bits and pieces of data. If I know I'm again, if I know I'm gonna do this kind of delimited work over and over again, I can use the settings option here to save settings, to load settings from an existing um, arguments list, or I can clear them all if I don't, if I'm done with these and I want to restart over again. Pretty straightforward um, in terms of how it works. Oh, I put the wrong, sorry, I'm gonna have to change my slides. That's the wrong, that's the wrong function <laughs> on the slide there. So I'm glad I talked about it. All right, so we will talk about that one a little bit later because um, that one's going to come back. All right, so let's. So those are the two delimited text um, creating and processing. So let's talk about XML conversions. So I'm going to talk about how they work in Mark Edit, and then I'm going to show you how you register them, where they live, how they work, um, and then how you work with XML files that don't have a translation attached to them. All right, so Mark Edit uses a model. So the Mark Edit model um, looks like this. It's a wheel and spoke model. This model's designed um, off of um, my understanding of um, a, uh, uh, some work that was done a long time ago on this notion of being able to do translations through a control schema. So in this case in Mark Edit, um, the control schema for the purposes of the application is Mark 21 XML. So Mark 21 XML is not the best schema in the world, but it can be used um, to capture a lot of data um, and it acts much better as a go between than say something like Dublin Core. So by using Mark XML as my center point, um, folks create translations that go from a schema to Mark XML. Once that's done, Mark Edit can translate from anything on the wheel to anything else on the wheel. So that's why this process works this way. It allows for um, easier uh, reuse of translations allows for translations to move more fluidly between different metadata formats. So what does Mark Edit do in this process? Because, um, you know, you could write these translations and run them in your favorite XML editor like Oxygen. Well, really what Mark Edit does is it facilitates the process. So um, an XML XSLT engine can't create a Mark record. Um, it just, it's not a full programming language. It's not designed to be. Uh, it also can't read a MARC record. So MARC Edit provides the facilitation, the translation from MARC binary formats into a format that can be processed by the XML engine. It also facilitates the process of going from XML back to binary formats. Um, again, something that the engine isn't well suited for. It also handles character translations. So I have a firm belief that XML should be primarily in Unicode. Unfortunately, there's a lot of XML that's not in Unicode. So Mark Edit facilitates character translations both from the binary file structure, so from Mark, translating it into Unicode, as well as from um, XML to XML translations, converting data from often ISO 8859 um, or 1252 to Unicode in order for the data to be processed more um, reliably and for it to be able to be used um, more reliably within MARC records. All right, so let me go ahead and walk you through the process of how it works and then we'll look at how MARC Edit manages um, XML functions, so how you can set them up and then where you can use them. 
So I went ahead and threw a couple XML files down. So this one right here, this is a, um, uh, an EAD file um, from my, uh, from Ohio State. Uh, let's see here. Ah, pray that loud. All right, so this is an EAD file from Ohio State. I went ahead and pulled this one down so we can go ahead and look at this. Um, also, I grabbed uh, a uh, ProQuest file. I'm pretty sure I threw the, um, the translation in there. So we'll look at how this works. All right, so by default, MarkEdit puts the translations into the Mark Tools area. Um, it's underneath the options here. So um, by default, MarkEdit only has a handful of built-in translations. There's the Mark Breaker, Mark Maker. MarkEdit has a built-in tool to move from Mark 21 to Mark XML and from Mark XML to Mark 21. It has a Mark to JSON and a JSON to Mark um, processing and an XML to JSON tool. Those are the only functions that are natively built into MarkEdit. Everything else is done either through an XSLT or an XQuery or MarkEdit special X profile format. Um, if you want to see uh, if you want to tell MarkEdit how to handle Mark to Mark XML translations, and since this is an important translation format in MarkEdit, you do want to think about how you want to do this. Uh, MarkEdit provides here in the Mark Engine options here um, under XML options to either use an XSLT to handle the Mark XML to access to to the Mark to Mark. 21 translations, or you can use a native option, which is a non-XSLT process. The non-XSLT process is much better, much faster. It's also um, a little more resilient. Um, but if you want to have the ability to customize the process that's used, you can tell it to use the XSLT process, and that then will allow MarkEdit to pull this XSLT file, which lives inside of the um, XSLT data files. You'll find it in here. Um, and you can edit that file and change the way, the behavior that Mark Edit processes Mark XML data. Um, and so you can see here um, how the XSLT process works and you have full control over changing that, allowing you to embed data into the record, um, change the way the record processes or what have you. So, um, the tool gives you some flexibility there in terms of how you handle data. MarkEdit by default wants to use namespaces. You want to use namespaces. Um, it is very difficult um, in current um, modern XSLT processing engines and MarkEdit uses those. It uses Saxon 9.x and further as well as a optimized version of .NET's XS, uh, MSXML engine. These require namespaces. So even when you use a generic namespace that doesn't get defined within the file, that complicates the way that MarkEdit handles the data because internally, the application actually does have to generate a namespace for you. Um, and that sometimes can get confusing. So I always say that if you're gonna be exporting data in Mark XML, if you're gonna be exporting any data, please use namespaces. It makes the data so much easier to process. Um, and so MarkEdit by default uses namespaces when it exports and creates data into Mark XML. Um, it makes the data more verbose, ver verbose, it makes it bigger, but it makes it easier to process. All right, so inside the Mark tools, we have the data here. So MarkEdit then um, has a Mark to Mark 21. So let's say I needed to create Mark 21 records. Um, I could pick a set of Mark files, um, go ahead and create my Mark. XML um, and execute that process. What did I do here? Oh, I'm using another file. I locked a, I've locked that file. Whoops. Close that real quick and figure out which file am I using. Close these. I've locked the file somewhere. All right, let's try that again. Let's see if I've, uh, uh, I think this is because it's being 
it's on my i think i know why that's locked i think it's because it's on my OneDrive thing i'll grab a different file uh, i'll grab this one so that should be uh not a locked file yeah we can see the mark xml file got generated it's just gotten locked uh, the outlook there we go so um generates my mark xml file so that file now is available um in mark xml uh it's right uh Must be this one. It's one of these. Which one did I create? Yeah, crazy. Uh, maybe I put it on the desktop. Yeah, I figure out where I put it. Anyways, I generated the Mark XML file. We can go back to the. Uh, file that I generated earlier that got locked up, just if we can want to see it. All right, so we can quickly open it up. Uh, Mark edit throws um, everything into a single line. So this thing's going to have a bit of a hissy fit. Um, so all the data goes into a single line, but you can see the mark data gets created, namespaces, so we have um, the records. So I could go back um, to um, mark through the same process, just doing it in reverse, going instead of from mark 21, going from mark XML to mark 21. Um, if, for example, I wanted to translate uh, that mark XML to JSON, uh, mark, has, mark Edit has an XML to JSON file. It takes your XML file, any XML file, and will translate it into a JSON format. So there are some, some limitations, but I don't think this will hit it. I'm going to go ahead and grab a, I'm going to grab my, um, uh, that file there. It's the, the EAD file that we have. We're going to go ahead and create a JSON file from it. So MHHJSON. So we'll go ahead and create a JSON file. So, um, Sometimes this, this can be wonky, but I'm going to see how well this works. Um, uh, super hierarchy can somebody be trans tricky for your JSON files. So let me see if that got generated. So there's our JSON file. Um, so you can see, let me throw it into Notepad real quick. Uh, you can see the tool took the XML file and outputs it as a JSON file for processing. So the tool can do that for you automatically. Um, so we have the built-in stuff. Um, we can also bring other formats into Mark Edit. So that's managed through the Edit XML file list. Um, we can see all of the defined functions in the drop-down box. Uh, we can add new functions by clicking Add. We can delete, modify, or download new ones. Mark Edit has um, some some files that can be downloaded, XSLTs. So these are all XSLTs in GitHub that you can download um, that are available that don't get necessarily set up when you create um, install mark edit. I'm going to go ahead and grab the EAD one just so that we can see kind of what that looks like. So modify. So the way mark edit works is you give it an alias. So this is the data that's going to show up inside of the um, everywhere where you see a human readable part of the text. So inside the drop down boxes. This is your path to the XSLT XML file. Mark edit, you need to tell it what format it's starting in. So EAD is another format. Uh, the file format is either mark, mark XML, or other. Again, that can be the original format. So you tell mark edit what's the facilitation it's going to be doing. Um, resolve remote entities, yes, no. Um, by default, it doesn't. That way, it doesn't have to do schema validation. Um, but if you really want schema validation, you can turn that on. And then the mark edit engine. So which engine do you want to use? So by default, it'll use whatever's created globally. So globally, I want to use this one. But by each translation, I can pick a, de a default um, engine. And so once I set those up, I, I save the, the box, and then it shows back up in my drop-down box here, and I can find them. So I can just search for them, EAD analytics. So this one will create not only a single EAD record, but it'll create records for individual series. Um, so I can go to my XML file. I can pick my, um, uh, my EAD file again, um, tell it I want to create uh, mark records.
and go ahead and send it on its merry way and it translates data. And if I go back to those mark records, uh, we can see that it creates um, a, a, set of, a set of data for us. So 10 records were created out of that one set. Um, so the EAD files are ones that I'm actually working on editing right now, partly because originally these were written for um, EAD files quite a long time ago. Um, and that was when we were using um, EAD encoding statements. Um, I'm noticing those show up far less often. So I'm, since I have the free time, I'm starting to tweak um, some of the EAD files. Can you translate multiple files at once with XQuery? Yes. You can translate uh, multiple files at once. So once you've defined an XSLT or an XQuery through um, the uh, XML uh, function list, and if you use XQuery, you want to make sure Saxon is your XSLT engine of choice. Once you've defined them and they show up in the um, drop down box, you can use the batch process records tool because now the tool gives you access to all of the XSLT, XQuery um, processing statements found within MarkEdit. And then you can process records at a directory or a directory subdirectory um, level. So I would say, for example, let's say I wanted to translate a bunch of EAD records to Mark. They all live within um, the desktop. They're inside a bunch of subfolders and I'm looking to process the data in XML and I'm going to output the file type as MRC. So I can go ahead and set that up and then tell Mark Edit to process and it will go through read starting at the source directory, the desktop, and then through all of the subdirectories, look at every XML file and try and translate it from EAD to Mark. And it'll use either the XSLT, the XQuery, or the X profile statement setup in order to facilitate that process. And it'll output all of your translated data into a folder under the desktop called processed records. All right. So let's say you have a file though, um, because I, in, in a lot of this work, one of the things I didn't want to be is I didn't want to be the bottleneck. Um, but one of the things that I found is that within libraries, there are um, at larger uh, academic institutions, at larger institutions generally for folks who belong to consortia, there's often expertise that can help with the translation of going from an XML um, or a JSON file format to um, something else. There's usually somebody there who can help with, the, uh, with creating an XSLT or an XQuery or what have you. Um, but that's not true everywhere. And in fact, a lot of times anymore, we're getting data that's generated in XML from formats, from, from applications that aren't using standard-based translations. So PassPerfect is an outstanding example of that. So here's a PassPerfect file that's been generated from um, one of our collections. And so the data here lives um, within PassPerfect. It uses PassPerfect's internal, um, internal uh, structure um, and the data spit out and I've been asked a couple of times to translate this data um, into other formats. Each one of the collections in PassPerfect uses the same schema but they implement it differently and so I can't create a single XSLT and these become one-offs and they take a long time to create. It's a lot of work to create these things to generate an XSLT that's going to create data that's still going to need to be fixed along the way. And so what I did in MarkEdit in MarkEdit 7 is introduce something called um, the, uh, the XML JSON uh, wizard. And so inside of the XML function list, you'll see XML wizard, uh, function wizard. And what this does is this allows you to actually automatically generate the translation for you. 
So I'm going to show you how this works with the past perfect data. This works with JSON as well, and I'll explain how it works. So we go ahead and click the box and we tell it the translation name. So this is what's going to show up in your drop down list. So this is going to be past perfect. And I'm going to mark this because I create a couple of these web and R, because I'll delete it later. Demo to mark. All right, so I, I tell it what the translation name is. So I need to select a file. This is going to be an example of what MarkEdit is going to be having to translate once it creates the profile. Then I'm going to create a profile. So that's an X profile statement. This is a portable file. I actually have a location on my computer where I store these things if they're going to be used more than once. Um, since I'm going to delete this one, I'm just going to put it here. All right, so I create my demo profile. So I tell MarkEdit what's the final format. So in this case, I'm gonna finish in Mark. That again, tells MarkEdit how it's gonna do the facilitation of translating data from um, an XML or a JSON format into a binary structure. Then I go next. So the next thing MarkEdit does is it reads five document level statements to try and determine what's the record element. So your job now is to help MarkEdit understand within this XML file, and it's going to see other ones, within this XML file structure, where exactly is the bibliographic data? Um, this is the top level document ele element. So if there was just all of the bibliographic data was here, I could tell it use the document level element. Otherwise, I'm going to look and use a record element. So in this case, I look at this. No, that's not it. If I look at this, oh yeah, that's the bibliographic data that I want. I want the element to be the report data. That's the data element that has the bibliographic data. So I select report data, it's highlighted. I select it and then I tell it go to next. And now MarkEdit knows that the report data inside of this kind of XML file is where I'm gonna find the bibliographic data. And so as it goes ahead and it, it pulls the data apart. And now the tool looks like the delimited text translator. It works like the delimited text translator. You can create constant data. You can create repeatable fields. You can join fields together. It works exactly the same. I'm mapping data from one place to another. If I click the select box, I can see here, okay, the title is field five. I'm gonna create a 245 subfield, subfield A. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and add that argument. Uh, I can go ahead and look here and see, okay, creator one, that's right there. So I'm going to call that a 700 subfield A and add the argument. Um, I can look again and see, okay, here's a, a date. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just grab one more thing. Description, that's going to map to my 500 subfield A and add the argument. Again, if I needed to join things together, I could select fields, right click on it, join the items, delete the items, edit the items. It works exactly the same as the delimited text translator. And when I'm done, um, it saves as a profile file. If I need to edit that profile file, when I get to this step, just click load template, pick your X profile file, and it'll re import all of the arguments. So I'm finished. I'm just going to create these three fields. I go ahead and process the data. It generates the profile. It adds it to the list. So now when I go to mark edit here and I see my drop down list, I can find past perfect webinar demo, demo, whoops. Past perfect webinar demo. I can pick my past perfect file and have it output and translate. And MarkEdit generated 103 records. Now, they're not going to be great records. I didn't actually spend the time to translate them. Um, but I can show you that the tool does take the data from the fields that I've picked and translates them into the, the elements. So what this does is this allows you to very quickly get data from vendors who are using non-standard XML that you're not going to find an XSLT for and translate them, actually map the data like you would a delimited text file and translate it directly into Mark. And again, once I create that X profile statement, I can use it anywhere else within the application, in the batch processing tool, um, inside the, the Mark tools statement. 
it allows me to, and I can share these. I can send this to somebody else. Somebody else can import it into their application, add it to the program. So the application allows you to create portable translations. This works with XML data and it works with JSON data. So if I had a JSON file that I get from a vendor and I've gotten a few recently where vendors are sending JSON data, the tool works the same. I point the application at an example, JSON file, I tell MarkEdit in the JSON file, where's the bibliographic data, what's at what level, and then I map the data and MarkEdit then creates an X profile statement that can then be processed um, using the MarkEdit tools. All right. Uh, so the wizard, um, and like I said, the wizard um, isn't available in the market at Mac version um, as of right now. Um, I've been working on it all week. I've got the interface done. I'm just finishing connecting the part that builds the, um, the tree view. And once that's done, then it'll show up um, in the Mac version on the next update. So Mark Edit essentially has a framework for handling um, XML data. And so that allows Mark Edit to do other things. So here's an example of how MarkEdit leverages um, that um, XML processing engine to facilitate other kinds of processing. So um, if you need to harvest OAI data and bring it into your catalog, um, harvest OAI data, uh, MarkEdit generates a place, you give it a um, server address. So the server address is the base URL. It is not the entire OAI statement. It's the base URL. You give it the set name you're going to process, the metadata type. By default, MarkEdit has XSLTs built for Dublin Core OAI Mark. OAI Mark is a special format that I believe has been mostly deprecated. It is not Mark in OAI. There's actually a different flavor for that. That would be called Mark 21 XML. OAI Mark is an actual format. Mods and then Mark XML. A lot of times when you choose these options, Dublin Core will always work because Dublin Core has an actual namespace. It's D, uh, OAI DC. Um, OAI Mark mods and Mark XML are up to the individual server to decide what those metadata formats are, uh, what, their, what their actual label is inside the system. So sometimes, and a good example of this is actually um, the, uh, um, IS, uh, uh, IR, IS, oh, I'm crying out loud, I can't remember what it is. It's the one uh, University of Michigan hosts where they put research data. Um, they use Mark XML as their, um, as their OAI format. They provide Mark XML, but they call it OAI Mark. So the way that you translate that data is pick, um, pick Mark XML because what that does is that tells Mark Edit to choose the OAI Mark XML XSLT and then change this to OAI Mark. And then Mark Edit will pass this string but use this crosswalk when it does the processing. If you're doing OAI harvesting and for some reason something doesn't work, you can always click on this debug URL. It copies the statement that it's going to pass to the system onto the clipboard and then you can open up your browser, paste that in, and see what the response is and see if you're getting any kind of errors. Um, also, uh, MarkEdit has some additional options. So you can harvest the raw data. So that would be harvesting the raw OAI data so you can get back that data without it being translated. Uh, MarkEdit passes a user agent that identifies itself as MarkXML or as MarkEdit. Um, that's because I like to be a... Um, uh, a um, uh, I like to be a, a good net citizen, and so MarkEdit identifies itself. However, we have some vendors. Um, uh, I believe the primary one is BPress that will block um, harvesting of OAI PMH um, by specific harvesters. And MarkEdit is one. It will recognize the user agent and will block harvesting. Um, if you happen to be a BPress user and they're blocking your stuff and they won't undo it, they will, if you tell them, I believe they block by default during certain periods. I don't understand it. I don't understand why they do it. Um, you can change your user agent. This is a customizable field. MarkEdit also includes some user agents for uh, Mozilla and for Safari. Um, so it looks like a browser, um, but you can change your user agent. Once you change your user agent string, it'll 
let you through and harvest your data however you want to. Um, so that's a workaround. Resumption tokens allows you to start harvesting again. So if you try and harvest the Hottie Trust's OAI feed, a lot of times it'll stop during the process because there's just a lot of data harvesting and it'll let you pick it back up where it stopped. Um, so anyways, you can harvest your data market. It automatically will translate the data from whatever the um, XML is that you're getting from your um, OAI provider and translate it into um, the mnemonic file format, which then you can edit, save, put into your catalog or what have you. The tool can um, run these as batch jobs. Uh, MarkEdit has a batch harvester. Um, you can create a batch job. Um, you can run that job or you can set it in the scheduler. If you're using Windows, if you're using uh, Apple, you can use CronTab, um, but you can set up a schedule um, for it. Um, I usually, I don't have one running right now, but um, on my work computer, I have a set of, um, of batch jobs that are scheduled to run uh, periodically that harvest data and translate it automatically for use elsewhere. Okay, uh, let's see here. I believe that takes me through everything I had planned to talk about. Um, yep, that's everything I said. We can talk about the open refined stuff later at different integrations because I've hit my hour. So I'm going to uh, stop. If there are questions, um, go ahead and uh, type them into the chat and I will try and answer them. Um, otherwise, uh, if we don't have questions, then we can call it good and I will pull this together and um, post it uh, onto YouTube after I get the transcriptions. Uh, yeah, sure. So I will, I'll include the open refine part because MarkEdit actually has some built-in clustering tools as well that are lightweight. Um, but MarkEdit essentially has the capacity to move data between open refine and MarkEdit. Um, so that, because uh, I know for the most part, the hardest part of working with open refine is getting data from Mark to open refine and then back after you want to edit it, um, unless you're going to build your own scripts. Uh, when I harvest in a browser, I'm limited to 100 records before I have to resume. Um, does Mark Edit bypass that? So yes, it does. So inside of the OAI harvester, um, your um, OAI uh, server will pass what's called a resumption token. And that resumption token will tell Mark Edit uh, what the next request needs to be to get the next 100 or 1,000 or 500 records because each each OAI server will set a limit on the number of records that it'll, it'll send back at a time. So MarkEdit follows the uh, harvest data as long as resumption tokens are present. Um, so if, you, if it makes a request, um, it harvests the first, let's say, 100 records, and there's a resumption token that says, um, this is how you get the next 100. MarkEdit will take that resumption token automatically and make another request and pull the next 100 records. And it'll keep doing that until either the server responds with an error, um, and that does happen um, if you are doing a lot of requests because a number of servers have a difficult time um, answering that many um, OAI requests, um, or you run out of resumption tokens, so it's harvested all the data that's there. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, I hear them talk. All right, so I'll give it just a couple more minutes and then uh, we will close it up. <clears throat> okay. So seeing no more questions, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the recording. <clears throat>